Today is the 11th of August, 2009. We are at the uh, American Legion Hall, number 216, in uh, Margaretville, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum. Uh, sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? Robert M. Carroll, January 3rd, 1946, in Brooklyn, New York. All right. And did you attend school in Brooklyn? Yes, uh, grade school in Queens and uh, high school in Brooklyn, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you graduate from high school? Yes. What year did you graduate? 1963. And did you go into the service at that point or did you go on to no, school? I went on, I went on to work for AT&T mm -hmm. and I left AT&T to do my Navy time and then when I returned from the Navy I went back to AT&T. Okay. Had you received your draft notice, or, or did you enlist in the Well, Navy? we knew it was imminent. Mm -hmm. in, in 1966, anybody that was 18 knew that. Mm -hmm. You had a choice. You, you could wait to be drafted any day, or if you wanted to not go in the Army, you'd want to do the Air Force or the Navy or something. Mm -hmm. And I loved the aircraft that we had Floyd Bennett Field nearby, mm -hmm. and they had a recruiting program for the Naval Air, and I joined there. And I became a technician on the, uh, at Floyd Bennett Field, the A-4 Skyhawk. And when I went in with the fleet, uh, I became a technician on the A-7A. Okay. Why did you pick the Navy? Probably the heritage. Uh -huh. My father was in Pearl Harbor. My grandfather was on a battleship in World War I. Uh, my uncles were in Korea. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the family was in the Navy. Okay. And uh, where did you go for your basic training? I had it right in Brooklyn, in Floyd Bennett Field. They had a boot camp oh, there. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I spent uh, a year at Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn before mm -hmm. uh, they sent me down to uh, uh, Jackson, Jacksonville, Florida, but it was actually Cecil Field mm -hmm. was the uh, master jet base for the East Coast then. Okay. And uh, I went to a training squadron. The A-7 was a brand new plane to the fleet. Mm -hmm. And we got the first ones on the East Coast, and we went to schools constantly and learned all the systems on the plane, and then we deployed on the carrier and went to, uh, to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long was that school? Oh, it was one school after another. Yeah. Two weeks on the radar, two weeks on the radio, four weeks on countermeasures, and two weeks on this, and two weeks on this. Okay. Uh, it just it never stopped. I spent almost a whole year just going to school and okay. on equipment, and uh, of course we had that devastating uh, forest all fire mm -hmm. while I was there, and uh, they changed the whole system in the Navy then. Every man had to become a fireman also, no matter what your rate was. So then I had to go to firefighting school, mm -hmm. and uh, then they also, the squadron also had nuclear capability. And to arm and send off a plane with a nuclear weapon, it takes a pilot, an electronics tech, an electrician, and an ordnance man. It takes mm -hmm. four people. They all have a code, and they all have a job to do. Mm -hmm. So then I went to nuclear weapons loading school. Wow. And uh, that was kind of neat. I actually got hands on the hydrogen bomb. We used to put them on the plane and take them off for uh, readiness ins inspections. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a pretty big deal to mm -hmm. me. Now, once you completed your schooling, what rank were you at that point? I was an airman. And then, uh, the way the Navy does it for promotions, they have Navy-wide exams, mm -hmm. usually like in September. And I took the test for aviation and electronics technician, and then I passed. And I became a third class uh, aviation electronics technician. Okay. Uh, toward the end of my, my time, I took... I kept my studies up, and I actually made second class, but they have a little rule in the Navy that to accept the next stripe and become a second classman, you have to have a year left to go. Mm -hmm. And I was getting ready to be discharged. And at that point, I said, I'm ready to be a civilian again. Okay. And they, they were very surprised that I turned down the second class rate, but I, I, I did my time, and I've been around, I went around the world on the ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw a lot, did a lot, and I, and I served my country, and I thought it was time to be a civilian again. 
So you spent uh, most of the time aboard ship? It's about equal. Um, okay. About a year in Brooklyn, uh, a year in Florida in training, mm -hmm. and then a, a year on the ship, yeah. Okay. Um, what did you do on your time off, like when you were in Florida? Or? Well, in Florida, it was just like a job. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of like a nine-to-five thing, uh, mm -hmm. unless you had duty. And uh, you, you could do recreation. You know, of course, they had everything, sports, gyms, tennis, mm -hmm. handball. You could go to town. Mm -hmm. You could travel. We, we had the opportunity to go to, like, on the weekends, you could go to Daytona or Fort Lauderdale or something. Uh -huh. It was, it was kind of, it wasn't so bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, once we got on the ship, it was a different story. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, then it became hard work, and supposedly there was two shifts, day and night, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. But in reality, you never got off in 12 hours because uh, if I went to work at 7 a.m. and let's say, well, by 5 p.m., let's say we sent a, a sortie out of say six six aircraft. Well, we, we wouldn't leave until those six aircraft came back, find out if they had any gripes, anything wrong with them, and then repair it before we would get off for the day. So we would wait, and they would come back, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Some didn't. Um, and then we'd wait in the ready room, and the pilots used to give us their gripe sheets and say, uh, you know, this light didn't work or this equipment is acting funny. So the next shift didn't take over? The next shift would come on. Uh -huh. But each uh, rate in the squadron had about 14 guys, mm -hmm. and we had 14 planes, so it really wasn't uh -huh. enough. I it see. really wasn't enough. So if it was 7 p.m. and we had planes out, we'd wait till they came in. If they came in and they had 12 problems between them, we'd all stay with the night guys, and we'd end up working 14, 16 hours, mm -hmm. go take a shower hit the rack and get eight hours sleep and start all over again. Mm -hmm. And it's just as well because there's nothing else to do. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you didn't really need free time. If I worked an eight hour day on the ship, what would I do the other 16? Yeah. So it, it kept us busy, it kept us hopping. And, mm -hmm. uh, How was the food aboard ship? On the carrier, excellent. Mm -hmm. I understand that we beat everybody in the service out because we got so much uh, food. Uh -huh. uh, other ships, they lived on powdered milk, powdered eggs, uh, water shortages, things like that. The America being brand new, it had evaporators that produced as much water as we needed. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was so big and because we were in combat, we replenished every day. Mm -hmm. They had a three-day rotation uh, after we would secure for flying. We flew, flew 12 hours a day. After we secured from flying, then, like magically, out of the over the horizon would appear a, a tanker or a cargo ship, and on on say day one of the three day rotation would be fuel. Mm -hmm. Now we needed jet fuel, of course, uh, diesel fuel for the ship, and then gasoline fuel for the uh, vehicles, mm -hmm. and av gas for the propeller planes. So we needed four kinds of fuel, and as soon as we secured the last plane, the tanker would pull up, all the hoses would come over, and all night long, they would just pump fuel, mm -hmm. and then on day two of the rotation, we, we we were running, we would run out of bombs because we would be dropping bombs constantly every day. Mm -hmm. So on day two, an ordnance ship would pull up, and they would high line. They throw the high lines across, and on pallets, they would bring bombs, and we would load bombs all night. And on day three, it was food, mm -hmm. and we got fresh food all the time. Wow! And we ate very well. We had. I think the carriers were the only uh, ships in the fleet that had fresh milk, fresh eggs, mm -hmm. fresh food. I mean, we were spoiled. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you, I, I felt bad. You know, we could see the coast. We could see Vietnam from Yankee Station. And I really felt guilty. I really did. We, we had clean beds to sleep in and good food. And I knew just a mile away mm -hmm. those guys were dying and being shot at and all. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get to go ashore? Uh, not in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We had many, many points of, of, uh, of liberty around the world. Mm -hmm. you know, I got to go to Japan, mm -hmm. Hong Kong, Australia. Now you had to anchor, anchor. offshore and, and well, then... Well, usually, except mm -hmm. unless it's a deep uh, port. Uh, the ports in 
Japan were made for carriers. Mm -hmm. So you could actually pull up and dock in Yokosuka. Uh -huh. And we went on Liberty in Japan. But if you went to, uh, say, Australia, we went to Sydney. Mm -hmm. Well, then they, they can't accommodate a carrier. Mm -hmm. You can't dock a carrier in Sydney. Huh? So you, what they do is they run Liberty boats mm -hmm. all day and all night, back and forth. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite port? Oh, it had to be Australia. Uh -huh. Absolutely. You know, the people who love us there. Uh, there's an old story about uh, World War II. Admiral Halsey and the fleet stopped the Japanese invasion of Japan, I mean, of, mm -hmm. uh, of Australia. Australia. Yeah. Well, they never forgot us for that. And when we got to Sydney, they turned the whole town over to us. They had an amusement park very similar to Coney Island. Mm -hmm. It's called Luna Park. On the radio, they told all the girls in Australia to come to Luna Park, and everything in Luna Park was free. Mm -hmm. And we went there, and if we went to a pub to have a beer, the men would say, give the Yanks a beer on Admiral Halsey, give the Yanks a beer on the Sixth Fleet, give the Yanks a beer on the Battle of the Coral Sea, give the Yanks a beer for saving Australia. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't even spend our money there. I mean, it was... Hmm. They loved us, and we loved them, and it was good to get to a place that spoke English, too. Uh -huh. Of course, when we went to the Philippines or Japan, you know, there was not too much English being spoken there. Yeah. But Australia was definitely the place to be. Now, uh, were, you, were you off the coast of uh, Vietnam for the Tonkin Gulf incident? Yes. Okay. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah. You mean the, the Tonkin Gulf incident? Yeah. Uh, do you remember when that was? Actually, uh, actually, not, I think that was '63 or '64. Yeah, that was earlier. Okay, that was earlier. So, so um, I was there uh, all of uh, 1968. Okay. So right. the Tonkin Gulf incident was much earlier. Okay. And uh, off the coast of Vietnam, did you? Um, of course, you you had aircraft flying in and out of there off the carrier. Yes. Correct. Yes. Did, did did you lose any aircraft at all? Oh, yes. Several. Mm -hmm. Many. Uh, only two pilots mm -hmm. we lost. Uh, when a pilot had to, first of all, they, they were under intense fire mm -hmm. from surface to air missiles and radar controlled guns. And they were shot down pretty regularly. We were we would lose a plane quite often and they'd replace it. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a wonderful ejection systems in the planes at, at that time. And uh, the pilots uh, would, would bail out. Hopefully they would get to the coast or mm -hmm. to the south where it was safe. So they, they were flying missions into North Vietnam? Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, a pilot had, when a pilot got shot down, if he got hit by a missile or a gunfire and he bailed out, uh, everybody went to rescue him. Mm -hmm. All the planes went there. Uh, we've had instances where we had a pilot sitting in the middle of an entire concentration of an entire North Vietnamese army, and the other pilots would not leave him. They would just keep circling and firing, circling and firing. And we would stay up for 24 hours if we had to. Mm -hmm. As soon as a plane would land, the pilot wouldn't even get out. We'd fuel it, put bombs on it, and send him right back off again. Mm -hmm. And it would be a mission where Everybody would work mm -hmm. constantly until we got that guy out. And uh, unfortunately, uh, one of my commanders didn't come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, What, was he killed or a POW? They, we, we didn't know at first. I didn't find out until I got home that he was listed as a POW. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to the Vietnam War, he died in captivity. Oh. And uh, I put that in my notes. He's, uh, he was the only pilot my squadron lost. Mm -hmm. uh, we had about a you know, dozen squadrons on the ship, and some of the other squadrons lost a pilot or two. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, we got them back. Mm -hmm. and, and how long did you remain off the coast of Vietnam? I was there for, uh, uh, from April till November. April till November. Yeah. Okay. Did, you, did you leave it all and come back? or? Yes. We would do what they called line periods. We would do like uh, 60 days mm -hmm. straight. And then we would get liberty someplace. They would give us a couple of days in the Philippines, and we would. The ship always needed to 
kind of like replenish mm -hmm. and catch up. Yeah. Uh, we were keeping the planes, the planes together with rubber bands and chewing gum. Uh, the biggest problem was getting us supplies and parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would be uh, scavenging and uh, what we call cannibalizing mm -hmm. aircraft to make other aircraft fly. And we'd take all the parts out of one and put it in another and get one that flew and things mm -hmm. like that. And by the time 60 days were up, you needed a lot of help. Mm -hmm. The planes were full of bullet holes and the hydraulics was leaking and well, things like that. So you would go to the Philippines and we'd get parts and we'd mm -hmm. get the material and the planes would get treated for corrosion and salt water. And uh, everybody would get a couple of days in port, you know, mm -hmm. and then we'd go back out for another line period. Now at that point, were you specializing in a, in a particular field of, of maintenance? Just generally the electronics of the plane, mm -hmm. whatever it was. What was communications, uh, navigation, mm -hmm. and electronic countermeasures, which were the most important at that time? What what uh, what uh, problems were most commonplace as far as the electronics? Getting parts. Okay. Getting parts. Uh, we could we could do anything, and as long as we had spare equipment, mm -hmm. uh, we could fix it. Now, did you normally? Repair or just replace components? Uh, we had, there's, there's two sections of a squadron. Uh, there's the operations part and the, uh, the repair part, and we actually mm -hmm. had two different sections. And some people's jobs were just working in the shops, mm -hmm. repairing the equipment. And I was uh, fortunate enough, I think, to work on the flight deck, and I, I repaired right on the spot. You know, if, mm -hmm. a, if a pilot got to the catapult, his radio wasn't working, I'd, he'd call me and I'd run up there and I changed the radio right on the right on the catapult. Mm -hmm. Button it up, close it up, jump off the plane, and send them off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sounds like it was pretty pretty it was, exciting, but it, it, it was must, exciting and it was intense. Mm -hmm. It was intense. It must have been pretty dangerous out on that flight deck. Wasn't they it? say the flight deck is probably one of the most dangerous places in the world. Mm -hmm. We had many, we had more people killed on the ship than we lost pilots. Really? Yeah. Um, you get blown over by jet blasts. Blown off, blown, the... blown overboard by jet blasts. You get uh, there's the propellers. Sometimes a propeller would catch you. And, you know, you, you got to remember we're on an area about this big, and there's you know jets coming out and going to the catapult and coming back and mm -hmm. in and landing and taking off. Uh, you've got to stay alert. You got to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And one one slip and a guy could back into a propeller and he'd be mm -hmm. he'd be chopped meat, you know. And, uh, you could get sucked into an intake that happened to somebody, uh, and uh, uh, the vehicles that tow the aircraft to the elevators and get them up and down and things, those dry guys drive with their foot to the floor. So these tow vehicles are flying like, I'd like to say maybe 30 miles an hour, as fast as they can, all over the flight deck, just grabbing planes and pulling them here or pulling them there. Mm -hmm. So you got to watch the aircraft, you got to watch the the plane, the, the vehicles, mm -hmm. and all the other things that are going on. Uh, guys were killed on elevators. Uh, guys were killed when tires would explode. Uh, if an arresting gear cable broke, it would whip around. It could kill five, six people in one shot. You know. What well, was that uh, commonplace for for that many incidents no. or fatalities? I don't know what the fleet record was, but they told us we had the best record of any cruise to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But we still lost, you know, uh, I'd say, I think three or four pilots and maybe a dozen guys on the flight deck. A dozen guys on the flight deck. Yeah. Oh. So, in the big picture, 16 men mm -hmm. out of 6,000. It's really, yeah. it's really a small thing except for the poor person that sure. lost his life. Yeah. Sure. But it, it, it was dangerous, and uh, it was an experience that irreplaceable, mm -hmm. irreplaceable. I mean, how many people can say they've been on an aircraft carrier? I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. Now, um, you decided not to, not to uh, stay in the Navy. Correct, because I had a good job with AT&T. Mm -hmm. uh, as the law said, and AT&T's policy was, all the while I was gone, I kept my seniority and my raises. Mm -hmm. So. By the time my service was up, uh, that gave me uh, s 
six years seniority in AT and T uh, and top eight, mm -hmm. and it was pretty good for 1969. Okay, and, and what rank were you when you were discharged? I was at, I was eight, uh, AT and three. Okay, I said I made I made second class. Yeah. I made I made oh, eight five, right. yeah. but but I turned it down. Yeah. Okay. And uh, once whereabouts were you discharged out of? I was discharged uh, in. Um, uh, in Maryland. Uh, I'm having a senior okay. moment. Where, okay. where did the ships land in Maryland? The, uh, uh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Got me. I'm, uh, okay. Yeah. The, uh, the way they did it was uh, President Johnson wrote an order uh, for uh, a general demobilization order. Mm -hmm. They were trying to cut back the troops in 1969. And uh, the order was anybody that had 90 days or less to go when the ship hit uh, mm -hmm. Norfolk, Virginia, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm saying Maryland, Norfolk. When the ship hit Norfolk, anybody on board that had less than 90 days was given a discharge if they wanted it. Mm -hmm. So I took that. And I got out a few months early and okay. I got off the ship at Norfolk and the airport was sucked in and every flight was booked and I just jumped on a bus for New York and came home that night. Okay. Did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Did you uh, stay in contact with any when you were in the service with? Uh, just one fellow, brief, you know, for a while, but then it, mm -hmm. it gradually, you know, you talk less and less, and the yeah. next thing you know, you don't, you lose contact there. Did you attend any reunions? At no. All? Okay. And uh, did you join any veterans organizations? I am in this American Legion here. And I, I, I actively participate in the uh, the USS America website mm -hmm. and the Navy Memorial in okay. DC. And you mentioned earlier, I think uh, before we were on tape, that the uh, the ship was eventually sunk. Scu scuttled or sunk. It was scuttled, sunk, and mm -hmm. to, to be used as a, an artificial reef. Okay. Uh, it became obs It was obsolete when they built it. It was it was built only for the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. uh, they they left out all the bells and whistles and just made it a, a basic ship diesel, mm -hmm. and uh, all the ships before the America and all the ships after the America were nuclear, mm -hmm. so they didn't want a diesel carrier in the fleet, mm -hmm. so they just destroyed it. Okay, how do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Oh, it made me grow up, absolutely. When I was in. You learn so much about responsibility and the importance of other people and mm -hmm. authority, cooperation, uh, courage. Uh, oh, it made me a much better person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wish all the kids today had a go in. I wish they didn't get rid of the draft. Mm -hmm. Now, being uh, that you worked on the flight line, did you have any... Uh, of, of problems later on in life with with your hearing or yeah my hearing was definitely when when you go into the naval air they give you a a, a hearing test where they chart it and they make a chart with a, a mm -hmm. bar graph and then when you leave they give you another one and the the bar is way down here mm -hmm. and uh they tell you you know you can you can complain if you want and you can put in a claim if you want but if you do we're not going to let you we're not going to discharge you Mm -hmm. So sign this release and we'll let you go home. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, you know, it's yeah. coercion and bribery. Yeah. And you, you, you want to go home, you do, your time is done, you know, you, oh, I don't want to make a case, I don't want to make a problem, you know. And sure, give me the paper and you sign it and mm -hmm. off you go. But everybody suffers hearing loss, that's for sure. You wear those ear protectors, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. The jet noise is, is, is astonishing. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't communicate verbally on a flight deck, everything is hand signals so loud you know mm -hmm. you can't just can't hear okay uh was there anything else you'd like to touch on maybe we forgot or missed uh gee you know you're covering an awful lot uh the fact that i lost my commander and uh the fact that we we went around the world we got to see a lot uh we worked hard mm -hmm. it was a good it was a good time in it did a lot I guess it builds a lot of character, and I think it does a lot for the people. Okay. Oh, do, do you you mentioned uh, an incident with uh, Ensign Brown? <laughs> Would you like to hear that sure. story? Sure. 
Ensign Brown uh, didn't go t uh, to Annapolis. He went to Pensacola, which is the uh, the 90 Day Wonders. Mm -hmm. So he was a very young fella, and they taught him how to fly it. And I, I think he was younger than me. He never told us, but I, I, I don't think he was as old as I was. He looked like a little kid, and he was an ensign, and he was a real character. And uh, he used to do silly things and make us laugh and come back to the to the radio room after the flights and uh, tell us stories. And uh, we all anticipated when Mr. Brown came back and he'd come in the radio room and we'd say, so what happened today, Mr. Brown, what'd you do? Well, this one day he came in. Now, I don't know if people should, people should know this. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was not a trail. It was not a road, mm -hmm. you know, like with a sign on it. This yeah. is the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was a network mm -hmm. of, of literally hundreds and hundreds of trails, plus hundreds and hundreds of waterways. It was uh, an entire network. Mm -hmm. And most of our job, besides troop support, was to interdict the Ho Chi Minh Trail because they would bring all the supplies down to keep their side of the war going and to fight us. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that they had was people. And <laughs> every person in the north would have to carry a shell down to the south. They, mm -hmm. they would travel for days, I guess maybe even weeks. Get to a gun, they put the shell in, bang, and tell the guy, go back north and get another shell. And that's how they, they kept the supplies going, one, one person at a time. So what happened today, Mr. Brown? He says, well, he says, I fly around this mountain, and he says, there's this guy with a shell on his backpack, riding a bicycle along the path on the mountain. Yeah, what'd you do, Mr. Brown? He says, well, he says, I had some 250-pound bombs on board, so I selected my wing stations. I rolled in, let go with a bunch of 250-pounders and flew around. All the bombs hit, the mountain exploded, I came around. So he said, so you got him, Harry says, when the smoke cleared, there he was going on the bicycle. <laughs> so he says, well, then what'd you do, Mr. Brown? He says, well, he says, I still had couple hundred rounds in my 20 millimeter. So I selected my guns and I rolled in. He said, because you know, you can't get too close to the mountain, you crash. You sure. know? So he said, I rolled in and I let him have all, all the rest of my 20 millimeter ammo. And I came around and the whole place was all smoking. And uh, so you got him, Mr. He says, when the smoke cleared, he says, there he was going on his bicycle. Oh my goodness. So did, did you ever get him, Mr. Brian? He goes, oh yeah. He says, I napalmed him. Oh, <laughs> He said, I still had napalm on board, so he says, I just did the whole side of the mountain with napalm. But to us, it was a great story, and mm -hmm. he made us laugh, and uh, he was like, we, we called him Cowboy, and mm -hmm. he, uh, he, had the, he had the parachute riggers, so the pilots used to carry sidearms, and he had the parachute riggers sew two holsters into his uniform, and he carried two 45s, <laughs> and he said, I, I'm not going to be a, a POW, I'm not going to be tortured. Mm -hmm. He says, if I have to go in, he says, I'm going to take out my 245s and I'm going to go down shooting. And he was a, he was a real cowboy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came back with us, which was good. Mm -hmm. Now, you want to tell us about uh, crossing the equator? Oh, that's, that's an incredible story. Uh, uh, if you don't have a Navy background or you don't have anybody in the family like I did, you probably don't know about the crossing the equator. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tradition that was carried down from the Vikings. And uh, whenever a ship, military or civilian, crosses the equator, you have to be initiated. Even like if you're on a cruise, an ocean liner, civilians have to get initiated. Um, before you cross the line, you're a slimy polywalk. After you cross the line and get initiated, you're a shellback. And it's very, very serious. You get uh, a plaque and a certificate and an ID card and you get, they keep records in Washington. When, uh, uh, for instance, let's say I went on a cruise today and they said, we're gonna be crossing the equator on Tuesday. Does anybody have credentials so you don't have to be initiated? If I didn't have credentials with me, they usually give you enough time, they radio Washington and Washington will radio back your credentials that you're a shellback. Hmm. So you don't get initiated again. Hmm. And, uh, you yeah. want to tell us about the initiation? Oh, the initiation is incredible. Uh, the shellbacks that are on the ship initiate the polywalks. Mm -hmm. And on the day of the crossing, 
they they build uh, what they call torture devices. They build uh, stocks and bond, uh, stocks and things that you put your head and your hands in, and they build uh, 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 pools of water. And everybody that's a shellback dresses up as a pirate, and the top shellback uh, plays the role of Davy Jones, and he takes over command of the ship from the captain. And then you have the royal court which is the royal baby, the royal doctor, the royal dentist. Uh, the royal baby is always the fattest chief they can find, and they grease up his belly, and everybody has to kiss the royal baby's belly. <laughs> uh, and you get a face full of grease. The royal dentist has an oil can, and he'll squirt oil in your teeth. The royal barber cuts a big hunk out of the middle of your hair. Uh, you go on trial in a court briefly, you know, you, you have to face the court with a certificate and they condemn you for trying to cross the line without credentials and it's very, very official. And uh, it, it's, uh, it varies from ship to ship depending on how big and what the facilities are, you know. Like uh, on a little destroyer escort with 60 people, it might be a very small thing, but when you have 5,000 people it becomes an entire day affair. A thousand uh, shellbacks initiating, initiating over four thousand men. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at, the, at the, the end of the initiation, you have to uh, walk the gauntlet of uh, fire hoses, and, and uh, they, uh, you have to walk with your hands behind your head like this, and you, and you can't grimace. There's a guy there with red paint, and when you walk in the gauntlet in the end, and everybody's hitting you with a fire hose. If you grimace, they squirt your head red and you have to go back and do it all over again. <laughs> so you have to smile all the way through the whole thing. Uh, probably one of the most interesting parts, I mean, with all my relatives being in the Navy, I knew all about it and I knew mm -hmm. I was going to do it. Um, because the A7 was brand new, it came with uh, tech support from uh, LTV who built the plane. Mm -hmm. We had an engineer from LTV from each division. So we had civilians with us on this cruise. And when they announced that they were going to cross the line, and everybody that has credentials better show up with them, uh, the civilians laughed and they said, oh boy, you guys are going to, going to really going to get it. Mm -hmm. And we said, guess what? <laughs> You're going to get it too. And. Uh, of all the engineers that were on board, one of them had crossed the line when he was in the service. Mm -hmm. And he, they radioed for his credentials and he got them, so he didn't have to suffer the uh, initiation again. But all the other civilians did. And the officers, uh -huh. there's a lot of people that made it all the way to commander without ever crossing the line. You know, they're stationed in the States, yeah. where they made cruises to the Mediterranean back, they don't cross the line. Yeah. So we had, we had captains and commanders uh, being initiated, and civilians. And, uh, it's quite a ceremony. I mean, they stop the ship right in the middle. People to this day say they don't believe it until I show them pictures. Mm -hmm. They stop a ship in the middle of a war, in the middle of the ocean to do this. I said, oh yeah. It's, uh, no ship has ever crossed the line without initiation uh, since the Vikings. Mm -hmm. uh, they tell me that on ocean liners, like if you're on a pleasure cruise, the initiation is much calmer. Yeah. They don't cut your hair and grease and oil you. It's <laughs> more like they might pop a bottle of champagne and pour champagne over your head or something. Yeah. But it does count and you do go into records uh -huh. and you will be a shellback, yeah. Wow, very interesting. Oh, it's, it's incredible. Yes, it is. There's, some of the traditions are just, you know, mm -hmm. just great. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think we've pretty much covered everything. Okay, that's great. All right, thank you so much for your interview. Thanks. I'll hold up that uh, photograph. Oh, okay. All right, and... Uh, How do you want it? That, that's good, just like that. And when and where was that taken? Okay, are we rolling? Yeah. Yep, we're this, rolling. This was taken in Jacksonville, Florida in 1967. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. I'll just describe okay, the incident. Sure. Go it's, ahead. It's, we're rolling. Okay. Uh, I printed it all out, and it's it's been published in the Navy Memorial and published in the uh, USS America Museum. But I'd like to just say it in my own words. Sure. Uh, when we were refueling one day, <clears throat> uh, the tanker came up alongside of us, and they shoot all the lines over, and you get your hoses. The two destroyer escorts that we had, they needed to refuel also. 
So one pulled up on our port side, and, the, and we threw lines to it, and we were refueling it while we were refueling from the tanker. Mm -hmm. And the tanker shot lines to the other destroyer escort, so it was refueling also. So now we had steaming the carrier, destroyer, fueler, and destroyer. So four ships, and mm -hmm. all, the, all the pilots are all keeping the four ships perfectly straight, same speed, trying uh, to do this refueling operation.